Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting, Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is the mind of Christ, and to do that, a couple of Christ-confessing Concordians confer with the Book of Concord to conform what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture in our Lutheran Confession of the Faith. On today's show, we're going to discuss why Concord matters for liturgical art. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Dual Parish of Emmanuel West Point and St. Paul's Wine Hill in Southern Illinois. And my companion confessor in conversation about this matter today is Pastor Jim Remke. He is the pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Pastor Remke, welcome to Concord Matters. Thanks so much for having me, Pastor Smith. Well, it is certainly a real honor to have you on here and talk about liturgical art here today. And just to set this up, In talking about why Concord matters for liturgical art, that may not be the first thing that we go to when we think about confessional principles for how we live and confess our Lutheran Christian faith. It would seem like there are a lot more important things. But at least for me, this follows as an episode kind of building on a theme that I've been doing in this little series here. We looked at what the confessional principles are, why Concord matters for worship, and we did that in a series of four episodes with uh, Chaplain Sean Denzer, the Director of Worship for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And then we transitioned from that directly into talking about why Concord matters for the worship space last week. And we did that with Pastor Asbury and talked about the work that Hope Lutheran Church in St. Louis had done, and especially that he had done in leading his people to consider the confessional principles for how they wanted to renovate their church space and really allowed us an opportunity then to talk about all the confessional principles that we can consider when we consider the worship space that we have and why we have what we have or don't have what we don't have and those sorts of things. And right at the very end, we touched on the art that they incorporated into the renovation of their worship space. And so I thought I really wanted to dig deeper into that. And Pastor Remke, I know that you have presented on this before, and I had found that and was really intrigued by that. And so I thought this is worthy of an episode in and of itself. Essentially, what is confessional about art for the church? Or what are the confessional principles that we want to consider when we are confessing the faith through our art, especially liturgical art or sacred art that we use in our worship space? And so I guess that's a good place to start with you, Pastor Remke, is What is it that we're talking about when we're talking about liturgical art or sacred art? Yeah, certainly. That's a great question. And actually, I was, my family and I were very blessed to be at Pastor Asbury's church for their kind of rededication and opening service after they'd gone through all that art. And it really is stunning and beautiful. And as you said, one of the reasons it's so beautiful is because good liturgical art, good liturgical structures, good liturgical practices always do this one important thing that our Lutheran confessions talk about in the Augsburg Confession, Article 24 of the Mass and the Apology of the Mass. From these two confessional articles, we read, For ceremonies are needed to this end alone, that the unlearned be taught what they need to know of Christ, and are not abolished, but retained and useful, and ought to be observed both to teach men Scripture, and that those admonished by the Word may conceive faith and fear of God and obtain comfort. So this is what this is partially what liturgical art does. Now, of course, in these articles from our Lutheran confessions, it's primarily talking about the Mass, and most in particular, the use of the vernacular in Mass, and the fact that the Mass is being said in German. The divine service is in German for the people to know and to understand it. But in my approach to liturgical art in my own congregation, I've seen this as very important as we look to what Scripture says, most notably from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, when we're told to take every thought captive, and from Colossians 3, 2, to set our minds on things above, 
the worship space then that we gather in is not completely adiaphora, and it's not completely just indifferent. These things help us to keep our minds on things above and to take every thought captive. And good liturgical art does this. It takes every thought captive. And as we read in our own confessions, it's good for the unlearned to be taught. So what are we talking about by the unlearned? Well, everybody, really, because who in our congregation doesn't drift off a bit when pastor's sermon goes on a bit long or maybe during the uh, distribution of the Lord's Supper, you drift off. You're not singing the hymn like you're supposed to, maybe. This is a great opportunity to have good, solid liturgical art that teaches our holy Christian faith and is in concord with the confession of our church. And so this goes along with liturgical art. It's not just whatever we want. It's not just whatever I think looks pretty or what this group in the church thinks looks pretty or, or the ladies' guild likes this and that and the other thing. Liturgical art must first and foremost do this important thing. It must teach our holy Christian faith. It must teach what we need to know about our faith, and it must teach also what we confess in our holy Christian faith. So this is not strictly an indifferent thing. There is the idea that so many people, especially in our modern context, look at art as only being a subjective thing. That is, whatever I like it to be is what is good. But liturgical art must always be objective. That means it must always be standing upon not individuals' ideas of what they like or what they think is pretty or nice, but must always be standing on the objective truth of the eternal word of God, which doesn't change. And so again, to look at our confessions from the small catechism, liturgical art includes our body and soul, eyes, ears, and all our members, our reason, and all our senses. God has given us all these things to put to use in his service. And liturgical art helps us to keep our focus on the proper thing. I really like how you frame that for us, that especially that it teaches. And that was something Pastor Asbury really picked up on, too. He called it catechesis. And I like how you frame there, too, then, that it's not just what I think looks nice. It's not subjective. It must always be objective. How would you say we go about evaluating that? Because, I mean, there certainly is, especially from an artist perspective and their style and things like that. And I may not have some appreciation of some of those things. But how do we focus in then on this objectiveness that you're calling us to have here when it comes to art? That even at times I may not appreciate some of the, and it's very liturgical art and objectively confesses the faith. But can you weigh that out a little bit more for us? Yeah, certainly. The church has always operated under certain rules and norms. You can even find way back in some of the earliest archaeological sites of early Christian churches, there are symbols that have been used in Christendom from the beginning, even symbols that have come over to us from Old Testament worship styles and worship practices. And these symbols have with them kind of normal meanings that everyone has always understood them to be. And so this is a good place to start. There are countless books you can look at that have good liturgical art, good symbols in them with their meanings. And this must always be the first place to go to is what does this picture mean? Before we decide, oh, I like this or I don't like that, the first consideration for liturgical or sacred art is what is it confessing? And we can know what it's confessing because, as we've been talking about, it's objectively true. I mean, these are things that have been passed down to us from generation to generation that Christians have always known about until, unfortunately, maybe the past couple of generations, there's been a real lack of catechesis about what things mean. But just because there's been a lack of catechesis doesn't mean that we should stop it. It gives us a great opportunity to bring the catechesis back, to bring the teaching back about what these images mean. And one perfect example that probably everyone has seen in a church is the monogram IHS, and you've probably seen it maybe on pyramids or on altar, carved in wood, painted on the wall. So what does this mean? I mean, I grew up with the understanding from my parents and grandparents that this IHS meant simply in his service. Well, that's nice, but it's not really what it means, is it? It is the monogram for Jesus in Greek, Jesus. And so this then brings a whole different meaning to it. And this is what also has to come about with any kind of liturgical or sacred art. There must be teaching. The people have to understand what this means, or it will very quickly and rightly so become unnecessary and really useless if there's not teaching that goes along with it. And we get this teaching from what Christians have done for generations, for centuries. Look at the art that Christians have always used and find their meanings. And this is a job for the pastor. You don't have to be particularly gifted in art. You don't have to know how to draw. 
You can do the best you can do as a stick figure. That's fine. But you can look and see what these images mean and you can teach your people what they mean and you can teach them an appreciation. Because as I've said, in our church, we've come a long way. We've added a lot of art in our church. And I've had some people say, I don't really like it. And my answer is, well, you don't have to like it subjectively. That doesn't matter if you like it or not subjectively. It's not our house. It's God's house. And God's house is about teaching the eternal truth of his divine and saving word, the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. And that eternal truth is very evident in sacred art, good sacred art, good liturgical art. And those are things that can and should be appreciated no matter how you feel about it subjectively. And this is, a, as I said, an important thing that people can understand and need to understand. You don't have to like it personally. I'm not asking you to hang these things in your home. This is God's home, and God's home is about teaching his word. And these things faithfully teach God's word. And as the pastor, it's my responsibility to make sure that the people know what these symbols, what these pictures, what these pieces of art mean, so that their faith may be enriched by this. As we say, ceremonies are needed to this end alone, that the unlearned be taught what they need to know of Christ. So this is the important thing, that we're taught what we need to know about Christ. I like how you said good liturgical art confesses and teaches the faith. And I think as you've laid out for us as well from the confessions, this ties in not just our ceremonies and what we have in the order of the liturgy and those sorts of things as well, but also the art that we surround ourselves with, the hymnody that we have. I have an episode coming up on Lutheran hymnody, and we'll be talking about that as well. And I think one of the problems that has happened in our culture is that, as you already hinted at there, one of the problems that we have in our culture is that we've gone the direction of another church body that has stripped out all of these other things. And we just have very bland sanctuaries and things like that. And you talked about how your congregation has added a lot of liturgical art in your church. Maybe just talk a little bit about what are some of the other traditions approach to liturgical art? And maybe have we inherited some of that even in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod? And then good ways to go about recovering liturgical art and its use within our life. Certainly. Well, I mean, absolutely. The idea that we have taken upon ourselves a much more reformed or Calvinistic idea of sacred spaces and art in sacred spaces for a reformed or Calvinist, any pictures in the church, if they're really hardcore, are clearly a second commandment violation. And of course, they number the commandments a little bit differently than us. So this goes for them. You should not make any graven image, etc. All these things. It's saying that you're having some idol. My first parish was in Western Michigan, which is kind of the seat of the Christian Reformed Church, which is in Grand Rapids, kind of like their international center. And I saw this very clearly amongst Reformed Christians there who, just so everyone understands, they're very good Christians. We have some differences, of course. And one of the differences is how we view our worship space, how we view art, especially in the church. And for them, it was offensive and a scandal to have anything. I mean, I even had people say felt banners with any kind of picture on it are a violation of the second commandment and are leading people into idolatry. So certainly things like crucifixes or images of any kind were completely off the table. So this is where we get this from. Anecdotally, my grandfather, who has now passed away, he was in the last German confirmation class in his church and grew up in a very beautiful little brick church by a river beautiful setting, very typically looked like a church steeple. It was very ornate. Everything about it when you walked in screamed, this is a church. When my grandpa was growing up, especially during World War One and Two, he was more towards two, there was a lot of anti-German sentiment in America. And his parish, actually, he had told me that there were times when they were in church and having a German church service, and people would drive by and throw eggs at their church because they looked at them as outsiders and as the enemy. This church had in it beautiful, very old murals on either side of the altar that people have probably seen. One is Christ standing at the door, knocking the other is Christ the Good Shepherd. And above the altar, there was this beautiful mural of two cherubs holding a banner that said in German, Selig sind die das Wertes Gottes hören und bewahren. That is, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And from one Sunday to the next, my grandpa told me, that they left church one Sunday. When they came back, all of it had been whitewashed, covered up 
because of anti-German sentiments, because these people wanted to fit in with their Protestant neighbors. They didn't want to be seen as outsiders or aliens, and they cut out the German. This is a big part of where a lot of our Lutheran kind of split personality of this goes. If you go to an old Lutheran church, you will see that there is art all over the place. For many of our modern sensibilities of as being Lutherans, if you've never been into one of these really old Lutheran churches built in the 1800s, especially if you've never been in one that hasn't been heavily remodeled and cut down in size, you will probably feel like this is too much. There's too much going on here. This is very European feeling. This is very ornate. And our modern sensibilities will say, I don't like this. This is where we get it, though, from our desire to fit in with American culture, especially in a time when our Lutheran church body, especially in the Missouri Synod, were seen as outsiders and part of aligned with the enemy in some cases. And also that allows to creep in that also switching then to primarily English opens up the door for us. And not that that's bad. We need to speak English, obviously, but it opened the door to a lot of different teachings, teachings of American theologians who were not Lutheran, who were predominantly Protestant, Calvinist, and who had this notion that all images are bad even to the point that many of our listeners today, many Lutherans in general, have the mistaken notion that a crucifix, for example, is absolutely not Lutheran. It's only something for Roman Catholics. That's one thing, thanks be to God, this little church kept their beautiful crucifix that came from Germany. They kept this somehow in the midst of all of their iconoclasm. And for me, the idea of, I mean, I, every church I grew up in, Northeast Indiana, had a crucifix in it. I never thought it was strange. Uh, it was because there was much less influence from the Protestant Calvinist side of things. But absolutely, this is an influence, the idea of not having art, of having bare walls, of having kind of austere, whitewashed worship space is definitely an influence from foreign theologies. It's an influence of Calvinism. It's an influence of just generic Protestant American Christianity. And so this is where we get this. Now to your second point about how then do we come back from this? How do we begin to add more liturgical art? I think that the most important thing is, honestly, what made this happen relatively easy here for me is the enthusiasm that I have for it. I love it. If you've been in my office, there's hardly any wall space because I love to be surrounded by these beautiful pictures that remind me and encourage me with Holy Scripture and the stories of Holy Scripture. So my own enthusiasm for it is important, but also the most important thing is catechesis. When you teach people what these things mean, these things then become important to them. When you go at it, and so when we went at adding liturgical art to our sanctuary, I sat down and made up a plan. This is what I want it to be. A plan that was all cohesive and went together, so much so that our sanctuary actually I've written up a little booklet about what all the pictures mean that I hand out. And every year at the first Sunday, uh, when we begin back Bible study in Sunday school after a summer break, the first thing that we do is sit in the sanctuary and I go through those things again because people need to know what it is. But in our sanctuary, I've broken it down to four chief parts for the four walls of the sanctuary and what these things mean so that the people see that the sanctuary preaches a sermon by the liturgical art that's in there. And the people know what the sermon is, and that then makes the people enthusiastic about it. The people then like to share this. I mean, it's kind of like, this is who we are. We're Christians. We like to share these things with visitors because it's really cool that we know what all these things mean. So our sanctuary preaches a sermon that allows our parishioners to share that sermon with people, with family and friends who come to visit. And I think that's a really important thing. As I said, the catechesis of liturgical art is vital. Don't just ever put pictures in your sanctuary because you think they're pretty. That may be. But if it doesn't mean anything, there's no point in it. Because as we have to always go back to our Lutheran confessions, these things, ceremonies are needed to this end alone, that the unlearned be taught what they need to know of Christ. And that's what good liturgical art does. Yeah, images teach, and I really like how you brought that front and center for us. And as you were discussing the anti-German sentiment and so forth, sometimes in our, you call it iconoclasm, that Calvinistic effort to just get rid of all of those things, and they have some theological reasons for that as well. I completely agree that that was a huge influence in our history. But sometimes as that influence has been around for a couple generations now, sometimes I get the pushback of, well, 
we can also just learn from the words themselves. And that's the important thing. And yeah, that's true, right? That's our primary focus in the proclamation of the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That is our central focus. And yet I like how you brought together that all of these things help feed that. Or as you talked about, and I do this as well in my own pastoral ministry, we all know that our minds wander. My mind wanders sometimes, even in my own sermon. And thanks be to God that when your mind wanders, you you fall upon a piece of liturgical art that is preaching another sermon at you. And if that's what you get that Sunday, and it's supporting what's being proclaimed to you from the pulpit as all faithful to the word of God, that object of truth coming. Thanks be to God for that. But again, coming back to this idea that you talked about the anti-German sentiment, I think one of the things that people fail to realize is just how powerful things do communicate. Because one of the things that happened in that anti-German sentiment was that's when we saw the introduction of American flags into our German Lutheran sanctuaries. Yeah, absolutely. Now, there's an image that confessed something right there. I don't know that it confessed the faith, and we're not being anti-American or unpatriotic or anything like that. But it was a move to, again, say, no, we are actually patriotic and we're good citizens. And that flows forth from a confessional faith, I believe. But they just stuck that simple image there in their sanctuary to tell everyone else, see, we are American. So stop picking on us. We're, yeah. we're with you. And they did start making the move to English and so forth. And I think as maybe might come out in the episode coming up on Lutheran hymnody, like you talked about with our art and trying to look like our Protestant and Reformed neighbors around us, we started taking a lot of the art out and things like that and whitewashing the German art. But I think that happened in our hymns as well as we felt the pressure to switch to English. We just didn't have our good German hymns translated into English and weren't prepared to do that right away. And so we jumped on a lot of American revival hymns and so forth as well. So this has had huge impacts on how we view the church and how we operate. And so you can't tell me that things that images don't teach because that was our whole move in putting the flags in there. Absolutely. And along with the flags, not only the American flag, but just the generic Protestant flag that flies in so many of our sanctuaries that has definitely not Lutheran backgrounds. I think it's Methodist or something. But this is another thing, too, that has come into. And what's the purpose of that? To show that we are good American Protestants. We are not specifically Lutheran. We're not distinctively Lutheran in any way. So, I mean, this is a thing, too, that we have to consider and and what that teaches. When you go into a Lutheran church and you see this kind of Protestant flag, and you go into a Baptist church and you see the same flag, flags teach things and have meaning. It says that we're flying beneath the same banner as the Baptists or the Methodists or the Presbyterians or whoever. At least the Catholics have the papal flag. I mean, that shows that they're not Protestants. And we, for that matter, have gotten a Luther Rose flag as opposed to the generic Protestant flag. But these things teach people things. Absolutely. We're going to go ahead and take a break here, I think, at this point. But I want to pick this up on the other side of the break, talking about that confession that says we're not distinctively Lutheran. And I want to talk more about why it matters to be distinctively Lutheran in our liturgical art. Maybe even talk about what is Lutheran about the crucifix. You talked about a lot of times there's that misunderstanding that that's Roman Catholic and so forth. So we're going to take a break here, but we're going to pick up on what is distinctively Lutheran and how do we evaluate that distinctive Lutheran confession in our liturgical art. More on the other side of the break. So come back right after this. You're listening to Concord Matters on KFUO. The USA is the third largest mission field in the world, and church planning is one of the most effective means of making new disciples, new missions to new people in new places. Get ready to plow the fields. Check out the Mission Field USA podcast produced by the LCMS Office of National Mission. You can find it at kfuo.org or anywhere you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Concord Matters as we continue talking with Pastor Jim Remke about why Concord Matters for liturgical art. And right before our break, I thought Pastor Remke brought in something that we've stopped looking in some ways at art being distinctively Lutheran. 
in this second half, we're going to definitely hit why Concord matters. And I want to bring that out because we do, that's the name of the show, right? We want that agreement in Christian confession. But I thought right before the break, you brought out an interesting point that we've stopped looking at our being distinctively Lutheran. And so before we can talk about how we have agreement within the Christian church on earth about our liturgical art, I think we need to first lay out what is distinctively Lutheran about liturgical art? How do we view sacred art and art used in the Christian life and especially in the church and our worship spaces as distinctively Lutheran? Yeah, the main thing about liturgical art that makes it distinctively Lutheran is its use in catechesis. It's not just there to be pretty, but we see this especially in uh, in our own Book of Concord. If you've got the reader's edition, they've got all these beautiful, especially for the small catechism, which was original with its printing, all these woodcuts that go along with each part, uh, especially like the Ten Commandments and things. There's all these woodcuts that depict Bible stories that teach that commandment. So the thing that, that is absolutely the most distinctive about liturgical art in the church is the fact that it must be teaching us things. I'm looking right now at our Book of Concord, some of these woodcuts, and they're beautiful. I mean, for example, the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. There's a woodcut of the unmerciful servant from Matthew 18. And this leads us then to delve deeper into Holy Scripture, to apply Holy Scripture in all aspects of our lives, to use all of ours, as I mentioned at the beginning, to take all of our thoughts captive on things above and to set our minds on things above. And again, from the small catechism, the creed, Article 1, God has given us our body and soul, eyes, ears, and all our members, our reason, and all our senses. These things he gives us not for just indifferent purposes. He doesn't give us these things to close our eyes and bow our head and try to cancel them out, but to use them. And Luther understood this very well with the use of these woodcuts, which I think is a great example of how what's distinctively Lutheran about liturgical art. It must always be teaching and it must be teaching properly and correctly. And it teaches for the unlearned. So for little kids who can't read, They can see these pictures for adults who maybe have lost focus. I mean, there's a reason there's a saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, because you can look at a picture and all of the things that you've been taught about that picture come out. You know, you look at a picture of your wife and you see that you don't just see a random person. You see your wife who loves you, who you've had a relationship with. And that kind of teaches you more about your love of her when you see a picture of your wife, for example. But absolutely the most important thing about good Lutheran art that makes it distinctively Lutheran in our worship spaces is the fact that it teaches. Pause you there for just a quick second. I think one of the important things here to highlight too as well, and we certainly, especially in our former way of operating on the show that we may get back to as well, where we just read through the Book of Concord and provided an audio commentary of it as we've gone. And so we use the Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, a reader's edition of the Book of Concord uh, available to you from CPH on this show. We would reference some of those woodcuts, but being an audio radio show podcast, it's obviously we can't show those and things like that. And so talk just a little bit more about those woodcuts. And I guess some people may not even be familiar with what woodcuts are. And so talk just a little bit more, if you would, about how those played a role in the catechesis that Luther and the Lutheran reformers would include those with the catechism. Sure. Again, this Book of Concord, the Reader's Edition, is great. Not only does it have the woodcuts, and woodcuts were just, it is what it sounds like. Somebody carved into wood a picture, and then that was able to be printed because you could put the ink on it. You could use the printing press from our good friend Johannes Gutenberg, and you could make these things mass marketed. You could get them out to people. You could get them in their hands. You could get them to people who were illiterate, to people who were literate. You could get them to children. You could get them to the heads of the household. They could see these things, and these things were important because it got the word of God out in a very clear way and in a very catechetical way to teach people things. And, you know, a lot of people, frankly, are visual learners. And this is, I mean, I don't want to say that on a radio program because it kind of undermines what you do, but a lot of people do need visual helps. It helps to keep their mind more active and helps them to more fully understand a topic. 
So another great thing, not only with the woodcuts from Luther's small catechism in uh, the Lutheran Confessions, the reader's edition, but there's all these great pictures in the back and the appendices of historical men and women who went through this, these people, uh, Luther's rose, his seal, great works by such artists as Hans Holbein and Lucas Cranach, and all these great pictures all were done during the Reformation time, and the purpose of it is to teach. The purpose of it is that people could see and know in an instant what's going on because they see this picture. And oftentimes the picture, of course, it has to have the catechesis with it. It was not enough just to have a woodcut. That's very nice. But this is the, the genius of how Luther used this new medium of the printing press is that he had the text, the catechesis. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things so that we, from all of the, the small catechism, especially the Ten Commandments, he had this that went along and was very easy to memorize and to learn, his style of teaching, that repetition. And then he also has the pictures, which helps us to delve further and deeper into what the catechesis is. So, for example, the unmerciful servant, how does this apply to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us? Well, I mean, you remember the story. This guy was terrible. He has forgiven so much. And he refused to forgive a tiny amount from one of his fellow servants. And what happened to him? He was cast into the dungeon with his whole family and wouldn't get out until they paid the last penny. That's a powerful message for us. And it's summed up very nicely in this picture, which underneath the picture, of course, is where the catechesis comes in. The picture is not the only thing. So you can't just put up pictures and expect people to know things. You have to have the catechesis with the pictures. And only when you have the two together, remember, as I said at the beginning, when you see that monogram of the name of Christ, IHS, People are going to, if you don't teach what things mean, they're going to make up their own things. And they might be okay. I mean, it's not bad to see IHS in a church and think, oh, this is you for use in his service. But it's not right. And also, I've heard other people say, I see the IHS, and you know, oftentimes it's the S in the middle, and there's the H behind it, and they say it's a dollar sign. Oh, I've heard people legitimately say, that's vulgar and crass. The church is only about money, because look, up there on their altar, they've got a big dollar sign. You've got to have the teaching, and this is what makes things distinctively Lutheran. Our emphasis always is on teaching the Word of God, not just assuming people know it. It's not good enough that we just assume that people would know it because we're not saved just by having liturgical art, and that's not the end-all and be-all of this. Having liturgical art or not in your church does not merit you any righteousness before God. It doesn't make you a better Christian or a worse Christian. Without the catechesis, it does really nothing. But with the catechesis, it can and does strengthen our faith. They really do go hand in hand really well together. And that's certainly, as you brought out for us, the genius of why Luther brought those in. It You help understand those things from those Bible stories depicted in those woodcuts and the art. And also serve the purpose of, obviously, at the time of the Reformation, part of the Reformation was a Reformation in education. I mean, Luther was really standardizing the German language for the people, and they were learning to read their own language. And all of that was happening in the schools as well and with children. And so if you're just even learning how to read, I mean, I've got two young children at home and a toddler and so forth. Those little books are uh, full of pictures and everything. And my son is learning what a dump truck is, not just by the words that daddy reads, but then he points to it on the page, right? And he sees that. And that's the same thing that we have confessing the faith with these woodcuts as well. And so learning to read and those sorts of things in conjunction with the image that goes into our mind as well, they go hand in hand really well together. Sorry to take us down that sidetrack, but I just really wanted to bring that out a little more. So you were going to transition then to a second point. Yeah, the second point then is how we have done this in our church to have things be catechetical and distinctively Lutheran. Again, you can't just hang pictures on the wall and just, oh, I like this picture. It's nice. I'm going to hang it on the wall. I've been in churches, you probably have too, where you see, oh, well, here's a picture of this, and it has no earthly connection with anything else. So that catechesis is so important. And so, as I may have mentioned, we've broken ours up into four chief parts, which are easily taught. So as you walk in the church, the one wall, that southern wall is, you know, you walk in a church, it's leading up to the chancel. On that southern wall, we have sacred art depicting the seven days of creation, and then an eighth with the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden. And that teaches us that we come into the church in the world that God first created as good, and he saw as very good, 
and by the sin of our first parents, which we've inherited, we have been cast out of this paradise. And this leads us then to what is our answer? What do we do? We've been kicked out of paradise. Where can we go for help? That leads us right to the chancel where we've got a beautiful big crucifix right in the middle over the altar or the pulpit and the lectern on either side, the baptismal font right in the middle. And there, this is the second chief part then, which coincides with the second article of the creed, the redemption that is ours through Jesus Christ, our Savior, which was won upon the cross. And this is why a crucifix is vital and beautiful for Lutherans, especially because we preach Christ and him crucified. This is the article upon which the church stands or falls, justification. How are we justified apart from Christ's blood and righteousness, which he poured out for us on the cross? A crucifix isn't necessary for a Lutheran to have. It doesn't, like I said, none of these things make us better or worse before God. That would be defeating the whole purpose of justification. But when you see this crucifix over the altar and you're reminded that you receive the gifts that Christ won for you on the cross, on the altar where you receive his body and his blood for the forgiveness of all of your sins and all of these things where you were washed in these things in the waters of holy baptism and you hear these things at the lectern and the pulpit, this then is the second chief part that we have. And then that takes us into our life in Christ. So we come in as sinners, Christ is our answer. And then how do we live this faith? Well, the Northern Wall has got liturgical art depicting the seasons of the church here. And those seasons of the church here remind us that we as Christians, through the calling of the Holy Spirit, the third article of the creed, are living within this year of grace. And we live from one generation to the next in the same cycle of God's grace as he gives us his word, as he teaches us about his salvation in Jesus Christ and everything that Jesus Christ has done for us, which is given us in the church here. And that leads us then to our fourth wall, the back wall of the church, which has the six chief parts of Luther's catechism detailed in liturgical art with Luther's rose. And this is then our response to all of God's work is to confess this holy faith. And so you see then this is what makes it, obviously for us, it's very distinctly Lutheran because it ends with the small catechism and our confession of this faith as taught in Luther's small catechism. But again, if you just walked into my sanctuary here in Kenosha and you didn't know any of these things, you'd say, oh, there's a lot of stuff on the walls and that'd be it. What makes it distinctively Lutheran is the fact that it has been thought out. We are desiring to confess none other than Christ and him crucified. This is our distinct confession of the faith. You wouldn't find the same thing in other churches who weren't Lutheran, you certainly wouldn't find the six chief parts of Luther's small catechism, uh, although most Christians hold to most of them, if not all of them. But you see, it's the catechesis that goes along with it. Even churches that use the liturgical year, they would see this and say, well, this is nice, but they would have a slightly different understanding perhaps of it. So we've got to be teaching what these things mean all the time so that people understand. A few times now on the show, you've mentioned the crucifix. And as St. Paul says, that focuses our attention on Christ and him crucified. That's the center of our faith, as St. Paul brings out beautifully for us in Scripture. And you've identified that and the recovery of its use within our Lutheran churches as being distinctively Lutheran. But we also can't deny that there is a strong connection of the crucifix with Roman Catholicism. Historically, Obviously, we come out of Roman Catholicism at the time of the Reformation, as we've celebrated just this last week, but can't deny that there is a strong connection of the crucifix with Roman Catholicism. And so as we look at it from that way, that even the recovery of it, and as you already brought out, at times, you know, we were trying to maybe even distance ourselves from Roman Catholicism to look more like our Protestant neighbors. But as we recover it and things, it brings out the point that We do share these things in common with other church bodies, or we will share the lack of things in common with other church bodies. And so I guess this is then the important point that I want to also bring out. Why does Concord matter for liturgical art? We are to have agreement in Christian confession, and that flows forth from what is taught in Scripture. That's the whole goal of our confessions is to confess the faith from Scripture So how do we have agreement and think about agreement when it comes to liturgical art? Sure. To go back to our own Book of Concord, what are the first confessional articles that we confess in the Book of Concord other than the ecumenical creeds? For Lutherans, this Reformation is not about doing something new. It is truly about seeking concord, that is, with one heart confess the holy Christian faith which was once passed down by the apostles 
And this is why we start with the ecumenical creeds. These creeds ecumenical means that these are things that all Christians agree on, at least in theory. Uh, and this is the sad thing. We've gotten away from this. There are many Christians who don't hold to the creeds, either just because they see them as man-made and unnecessary, or they legitimately have some issue with something that the creeds confess. But in this way, something that is distinctively Lutheran is the fact that we are distinctively not anything new. We are what Scripture has taught. We are the continuation of the Western Church. We're the continuation of the Catholic Church. And people like to tell me, you know, you've probably experienced this too. You're walking around with a clerical collar. Somebody comes to your church and they see you've got vestments. Oh, you guys are Lutheran. You're just Catholic light. I like to say we're Catholic done right. I think that's a, a good way to say it. We're doing these things in the way, the continuation of the Catholic Church. We've not gone afield from any norms, at least in our confessions. In a book of Concord, we confess nothing new but the holy Christian faith. And this is what brings true Concord then to us, is that this liturgical art is not for, though it is distinctively Lutheran in our parish, and it should be distinctively Lutheran, in being distinctively Lutheran, it's being nothing other than distinctively Christian. Because all of the images we have, any Christian could eagerly adopt and hold fast to. Even the images we have of Luther's six chief parts in the small catechism and Luther's rose himself. There's nothing about them or the understanding of them that I think any Christian would take issue with. Perhaps when we get to the uh, non-sacramental churches, they wouldn't like a chalice with the bread and the host and the grapes, which is a common picture of the Lord's Supper. There might be some issues with that or with baptism, but a crown of thorns. Every Christian knows what that means. Even a plain cross. Every Christian knows what that means. A dove descending as a symbol for Pentecost. Every Christian can be okay with that and understand what that means. Even symbols that take a little bit more to unpack, like, for example, the Chi Rho, uh, the first two Greek letters of the name Christ, Christos. If you teach Christians what this means, they can all say, yeah, that's okay. I like Christ and he's great. I can have that in my church. And this is what brings us kind of a greater concord even outside of the Lutheran Church, or the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, greater concord and understanding with other Christians to say, there are things that rightly separate us. There are things that we won't overcome until we are in heaven with Jesus, and there are no more divisions, there are no more schisms, but there are also a lot of things that still unite us. And these things are good and right and salutary, and these things are very clearly seen and depicted in much of traditional, liturgical, sacred art. And this is why, as I said at the beginning, where you find these things is you just look and see what the church has used for hundreds of years. And you'll say, yeah, these are good things. When you're not doing things that are new or innovative or that are really confusing, well, it does bind Christians together. I really believe that any Christian from the most liberal kind of mainline Protestant to the most traditionalist Roman Catholic, even perhaps to some Eastern Orthodox, they could come into my parish and I could explain what our liturgical art means. And they would say, I agree with a lot of what's going on here. Certainly not everything, but I agree with at least what this is saying. And the things that I don't agree with, that gives us opportunity to work towards further concord. Yeah, definitely. One of the things that I think is really important, too, again, as we continue to highlight, is that everything teaches, and you're either going to get a right message or a wrong message. And you've definitely highlighted really well for us the importance of teaching going along with our art, with our symbols, so that we get the right confession of it, because you can certainly arrive at the wrong confession. And one of the things that I think that happens, as you mentioned, innovation, and we change things, well, then you have to teach that, and you have to teach what that means. I remember a pastor friend of mine, Pastor Tim Apple, host of Sharper Iron here on KFO, actually, says this about innovating and coming up with new words, technical terminology that we use in the church. You say pastor, and at least the teaching has been around for a long time that you know what that means. But if you start innovating and using something else, well, what does that mean? Then you have to teach what that means, uh, whatever terminology you go with that. And I think the same would be true of art as well. And so teaching it is important. And you've brought out for us, you know, this is a great opportunity to talk to your pastor, especially if they're blessed enough to have you who is really passionate about this. And all pastors are going to be exposed to these things and have some exposure to them. It may not be the specific gifts for all of us by any means, 
But, you know, one thing that jumps to my mind is actually a children's book that comes from Concordia Publishing House, the publishing body of our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, that I really enjoy using and am using already with my own children as well. It's called Behold the Lamb, an in, in introduction to the signs and symbols of the church. It's a great book. Yeah, it's just, again, one of those simple things. Children love to go through books with their parents and they see the image and you read to them and you tell them what that means and they point to it and they begin to make those connections. I don't know, do you have other resources that maybe you would recommend or things that folks could check out? I've even had adults, you know, see the symbols in the stained glass windows and that are painted on the walls of my congregations here in Southern Illinois. And adults have asked what those mean and wanted to check out resources where they could study up on what those mean. Do you have any good resources to send folks to? Yeah, I mean, you always have to be careful, but the internet is a good place to find pictures with their meanings, symbols with their meanings. Also, I don't know if it's in the most recent edition of Luther's Small Catechism from Concordia Publishing House. I have one that's from in 2005 that's got beautiful illustrations in it. And at the back, it has an appendix. It has symbols and their meanings, which is very helpful. Uh, a nice kind of introduction to a lot of great Christian symbols and what they mean. Again, there are a lot of books on this, and the best thing, too, is just don't take these things for granted. When you see something and you think, oh, that's nice, but I don't know what it means, ask somebody or look it up. This is the thing, too. Pastors should always be about catechesis, but catechesis isn't solely the job of pastors. You can look for yourself, find stuff out yourself, and if you have questions, certainly ask your pastor. But parents, learn these things to pass on to your children. Find good resources. CPH has got lots of resources, I'm sure. Again, the internet, when it's coming to something as simple as, and this is the nice thing, too, Christian symbols, liturgical art, is oftentimes very simple and doesn't take a genius to figure out what's going on here. And it has kind of rules and norms. For example, a picture with a cross surrounded by a crown of thorns. Well, you can get the idea that is always going to mean the same thing. Or like the Chi Rho, that's always going to mean the same thing. Alpha and Omega. That's the beauty of good and traditional liturgical art is that it doesn't change all the time. These things are set out. And they have their meanings, and their meanings are their meanings. They're objective. They're not about, oh, how do I feel about this? And that's a good way to do it. Yeah, not to negate that some folks may have arrived at strange conclusions about those things. Certainly, as you mentioned, certainly. Even some folks might think that the IHS is a dollar sign in the way that it may be depicted and so forth. But yeah, they certainly, and I think historically, again, because just in the history of mankind, We've always valued the simple confession of things through pictures. And so the Christians have been very intentional in keeping it simple to simply confess the faith. And so you're right. I think it very easily comes out. Anyway, with just a couple of minutes left here on the show, I just want to give you an opportunity to go ahead and give us your parting thoughts then for today. Great to have you on. Really appreciate your passion for liturgical sacred art and leading us through considering how we consider its use in our Lutheran Christian life together and why that matters for Concord. But go ahead and give us your parting thoughts about why liturgical art matters. It matters because God has made us, as I've said a couple of times now, he's made our body and soul, eyes, ears, and all our members, our reason and all our senses. He's made these things that we may use them to glorify him, that we may take every thought captive and set our minds on things above. And so liturgical art matters because it helps us to do these things. It takes the gifts that God has given us, these first article gifts of our creator, and it puts them to service in strengthening our faith and learning about the beauty and the truth of his eternal gospel. Well said. Thank you, Pastor Jim Remke, for joining us for Concord Matters today and discussing with us why Concord matters for liturgical art. And thank you also, dear listener, for stopping by today. And until next time, keep confessing, church. Church.